Hi there, welcome to the Carter Report and thanks so much for joining us right here in the ancient, mystical, fantastic city of, of old Babylon. I'm standing in the actual place where King Nebuchadnezzar had his palace. Over here you have the actual walls, you've got the old clay bricks that go back two and a half thousand years. And in this place King Nebuchadnezzar, the great god, the great god king of the ancient world, held his feasts and drank his wine before the thousands. But even more importantly, this is the place where the great prophet Daniel came as the spokesman for God. And this is where God gave him those tremendous visions about the great kingdoms of the world, the, the great coming monarchy that is going to rule universally over the whole wide world. Also, in this place he had his visions of the great Antichrist. And today, I want you to join me downtown Los Angeles in the great Shrine Auditorium as we take you to Babylon and talk about the great prophecies concerning the nations of the world. Join us today in the Carter Report. Prophecy. It's used to peer into the future, but it must be learned from the past. The Carter Report presents Focus on Prophecy. From the Shrine Auditorium in downtown Los Angeles, John Carter unravels the mysteries of Bible prophets and brings modern meaning to this ancient book. And now, John Carter. Now this evening we're going to visit the greatest city possibly of the ancient world. That is the city of Babylon. Then we're going to take you to uh, the ruins of old Medo-Persia, then into Greece, and then into Rome. And this evening we're going to do something that we haven't done before, but we're going to make this a very, very special evening because we're going to put into your hands the actual Hebrew record of a very, very marvelous dream that the king of Nebuchadnezzar had two and a half thousand years ago. We're going to put this actually into your hands this evening. And then we're going to uh, answer these questions as we move along in our program this evening. How was Babylon protected by tremendous walls? The walls of Babylon were about 84 feet thick and uh, it seemed to be an impregnable fortress city. How was the city protected by walls 84 feet thick uh, captured? Because people said the city could never be captured. The question we're going to ask is this, was there possibly a supernatural force involved in the overthrow of this tremendous city? Then I'm going to tell you also tonight about a king, now this, this seems almost too hard to believe I know, but we're going to tell you about a king whose name and whose exploits and whose career was actually mentioned and described about 150 years before he was born. It was written down in Hebrew writings 150 years before he was born. And so that's something very special we're going to talk about tonight, the king whose name and his career, whose career was described 150 years before he was born. Of course, that would be a tremendous prophecy. And if there are genuine prophecies to be found somewhere, what do these prophecies prophecy say about us living today in the 1990s? Is there a message from the past? Is there a message from the heaps of old Babylon going back two and a half thousand years ago? Is there a message from the past concerning us today and concerning the future? Now, we're going to start our program as we always do. I'm going to go to the blackboard and we're going to start with a little, a little geography lesson. And uh, I'm going to put up here the places that we plan to visit. There, of course, is the, the fabulous Nile Valley. And then we come over a little further to the east and we come to the, the land of Mesopotamia, where you have the twin rivers of the Tigris and the River Euphrates. And on the River Euphrates is the, or was, the old temple fortress city of the Babylonians. And so what we're going to do right now, we're going to take you a little bit around the land of, of Iraq and we're going to tell you some of the amazing stories of the ancient Babylonians. I took these pictures just a few months ago by courtesy of the, by kind courtesy of the Iraqi government. I was given a special invitation to attend the Babylonian festival. Every year now in old Babylon, they're having a festival and uh, they're celebrating the, the wonderful, the wonderful kingdom of old Nebuchadnezzar. 
In Babylon, you have in the land of the Babylonians, you have some amazing sights even today. This is the tower, the, the special tower that was built about a thousand years ago at Samara. It was built by the Muslims and uh, it is reminiscent of some of the old towers that are, are famous in that part of the world. Of course, when you go to that part of the world, you think instantly of the, of the tower of Babel. And uh, this goes back thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, the Bible tells the story how these people came to the land of China or to Babylonia, and they built this great tower whose top they thought was going to reach up to heaven. And uh, even in this area today, there are still towers uh, in the old uh, ruins of the city of Babylon, there are the remains of the, of the ziggurat of Babylon. Some people believe that, of course, was the Tower of Babel. The land of Iraq, of course, is today predominantly a Muslim country. It's a very, very wonderful country with a, with a, mar a, a, marvelous, a marvelous history. And uh, the people there treated me marvelously well. I was a foreigner, I was the first person to go there for some time with a foreign television crew, and they treated me tremendously well. This is the Tigris River on which is seated today the modern capital of Iraq, the, the wonderful city of Baghdad. Baghdad has become one of the most uh, affluent, one of the most prosperous cities in, in the world today. When I was there about 20 years ago, when I first went to Baghdad about 20 years ago, it was nothing like the Baghdad of today. Now we're going to take you right down into the old city of Babylon itself. And uh, I want to come to the blackboard again, and I want to put up just a little archaeological drawing of the, uh, of the ruins, or rather, of the city of Babylon, uh, as it existed thousands and thousands of years ago. The city of Babylon was seated upon the great river Euphrates. It was a very, very large city for those days. It was surrounded by walls, uh, with a cumulative thickness of 84, th uh, 84 feet. So it was a, a very, very big city. You had double walls, and so the place was, was practically a fortress city. To the north, up here somewhere, and we don't have room on the blackboard, but up here to the north was the great summer palace of, of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so this was the place that ruled the world between about 605 and 538 BC. Some very interesting things have been going on in Babylon in just the last few years. The Iraqi government has embarked upon a very uh, ambitious, almost extravagant scheme to, to restore the ruins of old Babylon. Now, it has not become a, a place where people go to live, but archaeologists have been building on the ruins of old Babylon and trying to give tourists, and there aren't too many tourists who go there, but have been trying to give people who do go there some idea what the old city of Babylon originally was like. It's a very, very interesting thing that the Babyl Babylonians took as their symbol the winged line. And when you read the prophecies of the book of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, uh, the Jewish prophet Daniel describes the Babylonians by the symbol of the wing line. It was a fantastic place in its, in its heyday. I don't think there was any city on the face of the earth which was more beautiful than the old city of the Babylonians. Uh, you find very little stone in Babylon. Everything was built out of, uh, out of brick. And uh, the, the walls of the city were, were yellow, the temples were white, and the palaces were rose red. It was filled with these gorgeous buildings, gorgeous buildings, all covered with these, these wonderful clay tiles. And uh, today, even after two and a half thousand years, those clay tiles still have a very beautiful luster. In Babylon, thousands of years ago, two and a half thousand years ago, there were 53 temples and dozens and dozens and almost hundreds of shrines. It was a city that was dedicated also to the great goddess Ishtar. They celebrated the great festival of Ishtar, and this word Ishtar, ladies and gentlemen, is quite an interesting word because from the term Ishtar we get the term Easter. And uh, I was going through there once with uh, an archaeologist, and he said to me, it's amazing how many customs that we think today are really Christian, or a Western, or, or American, or, or a British, but they've got nothing to do really with our present civilization. They go back to the days of the Babylonians. And so from Ishtar, the time of Ishtar, Ishtar, in the time of the spring, which was worked out according to the moon goddess, because the moon goddess was called Ishtar. 
And uh, so they had this ceremony in the, in the spring, and this was passed down to the Persians and to the Greeks and finally to the Romans, and this is how it came into the Western world and how it came into the Christian church. The person, of course, who built just about everything uh, in Babylon was the great potentate Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, there was an old Babylon that went back many, many thousands of years, back to the days of the Tower of Babel. But then you have the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And the great builder of Babylon was this charismatic warlord whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he became the king of Babylon in the year 605 B.C. And when you read in the Bible, the book of Daniel and the book of Isaiah, you read a great deal about the exploits of the great warlord of Babylon whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. And in the book of Daniel he says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for my glory? On the left-hand screen is the processional way. And uh, this was like a six-lane highway running right through the very heart of Babylon. And so the city was composed of beautiful buildings and beautiful temples made out of brick and uh, covered with glazed tiles. They were a very, very religious people. Uh, they had uh, all the opulence of the, of the Orient, everything that you can imagine. They were a fierce people, a warlike people. And uh, this was the place where Daniel came. When Jerusalem was overthrown by the Babylonians about 600 years before Jesus, the Babylonians took to the land of Babylonia some of the princes of, of the Jews. And one of the most conspicuous Jewish prophets who went along there with the rest of the prisoners of war was a young man whose name was Daniel. And he was taken here as a prisoner of war and he was taken here to Babylon. And on this brick over on the left-hand screen are the words, I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of kings. And uh, he left his mark all the way around, around Babylon. It wasn't so very many years ago when skeptics were laughing at the Bible because it spoke about Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and all of these famous characters. Because for many years, skeptics said that there were no such characters and they were simply myths. They were simply pious myths. We now know today that these people were real flesh and blood characters and we know for a certainty that the skeptics were were wrong and the Bible writers were right. That's an absolute fact. It's pretty hot here today in Babylon, climbing around old Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace or what is left of the place. As I've wandered around here this morning, one great thought has kept pounding into my mind as I've been looking at the cuneiform inscriptions and, and handling the bricks. The thought has kept coming into my mind, the Bible is absolutely correct. You see, 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah said that the greatest city of the ancient world would become just a heap of ruins. And as I've walked around here today, the word has come to my mind, the Bible was absolutely correct. You can believe the Bible. It is the word of God. The stones, the, the old cuneiform inscriptions, the, the, the mass of... of of clay bricks all testify to the truth that the Bible prophecy came to pass. I'd like to give you some of this information. I'd like to send it to you. I want you to call me now. Go to your telephone and call me. The number is now appearing on the screen. Call me now or write to me, John Carter, Box 3390, Hollywood, California, 90028. This is John Carter reporting from Nebuchadnezzar Summer Palace with a message, the Bible is true. And when you go to Babylon, your faith in the Word of God, the Bible, is tremendously reinforced the historicity of the Christian Scriptures. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this one over here is tremendously significant. You notice it says here, the foundation cylinder marking the restoration of the temple of the moon god at Ur by King Nabonidus. It ends with a prayer for him and his son Belshazzar. You see, in the Bible, it tells us that Belshazzar was the last king of the Babylonians. And most of you folk who uh, have got a biblical Christian Jewish background will know the story of how the, the city of Babylon was taken and how it was captured. It talks about the king having this tremendous feast.
And while he's having the feast, the bloodless hand of, of a man comes out and writes upon the plaster over on the wall and says, meany, meany, tackle you fasten. You know the story. And this is the feast of the, of the king, uh, not Belshazzar, not, not Nebuchadnezzar, but Belshazzar, who was the grandson of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Now this was a strange story because when we read all the history of the, of the ancients, when we read all of their, their manuscripts, it was apparent that Nabonidus was the last king of the Babylonians, not Belshazzar. But the Bible says that the last king, the person who was sitting on the throne, was a man by the name of, of Belshazzar. And the skeptics, until only relatively recent times, were, were having a field day and laughing their heads off. But then this little tablet was discovered there in Mesopotamia, and the, and the solution became very apparent. Do you know what really happened? Well, Nabonidus got sick of politics. He got sick of the Babylonian court. He got sick of the intrigue, and he retired, and he went off to the desert regions. And he appointed his son, this waster, whose name was Belshazzar, to be the reigning monarch. And so, in reality, it was Belshazzar who was sitting on the throne of, of Babylon on the last night of Babylon. And so, this little tablet that was on the screen is a, is a remarkable confirmation of the historicity of the ancient Hebrew writings. Also, the Babylonians consider themselves to be the line. The lion is the king of beasts, and once upon a time that whole area was full of lions. And just as the lion is the king of beasts, so Babylon was the king of kingdoms. About 700 years before Christ, before Babylon had reached her heyday, and she became a tremendous power. Babylon controlled the then known world. But before she even reached her heyday, before she reached her peak, a Jewish prophet came along and made a remarkable prediction about the Babylonians. Now, just hold on, gentlemen, up there. I want to tell the people about this. This is the Cyrus Cylinder. Now, just remember this. This is the Cyrus Cylinder. It talks about the great Persian king whose name was Cyrus. He was the, per, uh, the, the king who overthrew the, the kingdom of Babylon in 538 B.C., and the amazing thing is this, I'll get back to the other story in a moment, but I want you to see this. 150 years before Cyrus was born, this is the Cyrus cylinder that tells about his exploits, but 150 years before Cyrus was born, the prophet Isaiah mentioned him literally by name and spoke about his exploits and said that he was going to be the king who was going to overthrow the Babylonians. This man's name was actually mentioned in the Hebrew manuscripts 150 years before he was born. And when he came 150 years after he was predicted, after he was mentioned in the prophecies, when he came and uh, uh, overthrew the city of Babylon, he found that the city of Babylon had a lot of Jewish captives there. And the Jewish captives showed him the writings of the prophet Isaiah, and they showed him where his name had been mentioned 150 years before he was born. And this so impressed him that he sent the children of Israel, he let them go back and restore the, the city of Jerusalem. That is a remarkable story. But about the same time, even before, when you go back uh, 150 years before Cyrus, but back to the days of the prophet Isaiah, you have a remarkable prophecy which is made concerning the kingdom of the, of the Babylonians. And I want to take a moment now, and I want to turn over here in the, in the Scriptures to the book of Isaiah, chapter 13, I want you to notice this because it's exciting, it's amazing. Isaiah 13 and verse 19 says, now this is before Babylon reached her heyday, this is before she, she got to the pinnacle of power, and so this is about 150 years before she got to her, to the, to the zenith, it says, and Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, 
will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Nor will the Arabian pitch tent there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will be there. Now, I just want you to think for a moment of the remarkable significance of that prophecy. It said concerning this tremendous city that was the greatest city in the world, it would be so destroyed, it would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. And not even a, a person would want to go there. Not a person would want to go there. It said the Arabs wouldn't even go there and bring their, their herds of, of sheep there. But it says there'd be wild creatures there. I had a remarkable experience just a few months ago when I was visiting there. I climbed up this mound here. That is the mound of Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace. That's the, that's the portion here up to the north. Over here up to the north. Now this is where they're doing some of the so-called restoration. But up here is the original mound of Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace. And I was walking up there ahead of the television crew and I was stumbling over the old cuneiform tablets and, and climbing up and it was, it was tremendously hot. I, I got a touch of, of sunstroke. It was so hot the day I was there. But as I was climbing up there, all of a sudden, a, a jackal came out of a hole in the ground just in front of me and ran across just in front of me. And I immediately thought of the words of the prophet. He said that jackals and wild animals would live in the ruins of Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And there I was, standing in Nebuchadnezzar's palace, two and a half thousand, two thousand seven hundred years after the prediction had been given. And there was a jackal running across in front of me. And the whole place is, as you can see it on the screen, just a howling wilderness and nobody lives there. The prophecy has been remarkably fulfilled. You know, it gives you a, a strange feeling when you walk around these places and you can say, I have seen the prophecies fulfilled. I want to say tonight, look, let me say this from my, my heart to yours. Let me say this with all the sincerity of my soul. If there's a person here tonight who doesn't believe in God, you, you don't know what you believe in. You'd like to believe though. I want to tell you something. You can believe. You can believe because there is a tremendous amount of evidence why you can believe. The reason I believe is because I have seen the evidence of archaeology and I have seen the Bible prophecies fulfilled. It's, it's a wonderful reassurance when you go to these places and you can see what these places once were like and you can read the prophecies and you can see how the prophecies have come to pass. I want to tell you how the city was overthrown. This is one of the great stories of antiquity. When you go back in the Old Testament, you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 15, verse 51, as well as uh, Jeremiah, chapter 15, 51, and also the book of Isaiah, chapter 13. And you read there the prophecy that I've just read to you that this place is going to become like Solomon and Gomorrah. But the years rolled by and Babylon became an even greater city. And then you have Nebuchadnezzar and you have all of his buildings and we've shown you some of his exploits on the screen. We've shown you the tablets of, of Nebuchadnezzar. And then you come down to the time of his grandson or his gra great grandson, this wicked man whose name was Belshazzar. And he's having this tremendous feast that we alluded to before. Now the prophet said 150 years before Belshazzar was born that the river Euphrates was going to be dried up. And the great gates of the, of the river, the great gates that led into the city, these gates were not going to be locked. Now what I'm going to tell you now is a story that is stranger than fiction. When Cyrus came along here to overthrow the great city of the Babylonians, he put his soldiers around the city. But he could not break down the walls of the city because the walls were 40 feet high and the cumulative thickness of the walls was 84 feet. He could not overthrow the city. Would you like to know what he did? Well, the prophet said, there's a drought upon the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates is going to be dried up. Do you, do you, would you like to know what, what, what Cyrus did? He caused a great dam to be built, a great artificial lake, and he drained out the waters of the river Euphrates. 
And the water dropped dramatically and he marched his Persian soldiers down the muddy banks and into the bed of the river and they waded along up to their, up to their uh, necks in water. And then they came to the great city gates, those tremendous bronze gates that were never, never uh, left in a state of insecurity. But that night Babylon was drunk. They were having the tremendous feast in honor of, of uh, Belshazzar. And they had this tremendous feast going on. And then this writing came out that said, Meany, meany, tackle you fasten, you weight in the balances and found wanting. That was in the days of the prophet Daniel. And then all of a sudden, when those soldiers were wading down the riverbed, when they came to those tremendous big gates, they were amazed to discover that the gates were not locked. And the gates just opened up. And the soldiers of Cyrus the Great marched into that place. And that night the blood of the king, Belshazzar, mingled with the wine of the banquet hall and Babylon was overthrown. And since that day, Babylon continued to go down and down and down and down. And then Babylon was lost to the world. And today, even though they have done some restoration work, and even though they have um, put up some new walls on the old walls of Babylon, and even though they have festivities going on there uh, every year now at the Babylon Festival, even though they bring in dancers from around the world, I want to tell you folks something. When the lights go out and the dancers go home, everybody leaves the ruins of old Babylon, and they get in their cars and they go back to Baghdad and the silence of the tomb descends upon the city of Babylon exactly as the prophet said two and a half thousand years ago. An amazing story. And so when I've gone to Babylon and when I've seen the ruins, I've come back and I've come back with a strong conviction. When I went to Egypt, I came back with a strong conviction. And when I went to Babylon, I came back with a strong conviction. I came back with a conviction that said, there is a God in heaven and God has got this whole world in his hand and God can see the future and you can have faith in God.